So with that, we'll start, um, we'll start getting ready here for uh, Dr. Greg Lee and his workshop session. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce um, each speaker at the start of their session. And uh, Dr. Lee will start this first workshop session. Ah, there's at least his image, um, which is titled Alternatives to Asian American Achievements. So before I turn this over, let me just quickly introduce um, Dr. Lee. Um, Greg Lee is uh, an associate professor of theology and urban studies at Wheaton College, where he also serves as senior fellow for the Wheaton Center for Early Christian Studies, um, team coordinator of the Aquitas Fellows Program in Urban Leadership and co-director of the Center for Urban Engagement. His research concentrates on the theology of Augustine and its relevance today. A resident of the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago, he is especially interested in urban questions of race and class. He has a developing interest in Asian American theology and ethics as well. And Dr. Lee's um, current book project is titled um, Christians Among the Corrupt, Augustine Race and the Challenge of Immoral Communities, which retrieves Augustine's understanding of church and society to address contemporary issues of Christianity and race. He's also producing an abbreviated and annotated edition of Augustine's City of God um, with Baker Academic. And outside of Wheaton, um, Greg is theologian in residence at Lawndale Christian Community Church. He served for several years as board chair of Manor Christian Fellowship, a campus ministry here at the university where he was a student. So um, with that, Greg, I hope I didn't say anything that was incorrect about you. And if I did, um, correct me, please. Um, and good seeing you, Aaron. All right. Lovely. Great. Um, well, thanks so much, Dr. Chuang. It's great to be with you all. Um, uh, Dr. Boy's book, um, Discipline by Race, is uh, something that really affected me um, when I first read it, and it continues to shape um, the way I think about Asian American race issues. So it's great to be with him. Um, that's a book I really recommend. I've assigned it several times for class, very accessible, and um, introduces a lot of core issues um, for how Asian Americans fit into race conversations in this country. Um, also want to thank Dr. Chow um, for the invitation to participate in this workshop. He's somebody that um, that I really admire for his administrative and intellectual leadership over the Center for Asian American Christianity at PTS, and it's an honor to be with you. So since this is the first workshop in our track today on race and Asian American discipleship, I thought I would begin my remarks with some general issues that seem broadly important to the theme. Um, the next two workshops, as I understand them, are going to dive deeper into some specific topics. And then I think, you know, we'll all come back together at the end for the final panel when we can put some of the pieces um, back together. I'm going to um, post a, um, I'm going to work off a PowerPoint. So let me go ahead and put that up right now. I'm assuming everybody can see this and everybody can see and hear me because um, I'm not getting any frantic tech. Uh, chats about this or anything like that. So um, yeah, I can't see you all. So I'm just speaking to a screen. All right. So I'd like to, um, the title of my talk is Alternatives to Asian American Achievement. And I'd like to just begin with um, a discussion question. Okay. The discussion question, I will just say, and then I'd like you to put your answer in the chat and then I'll sort of figure out how to go to the next slide on this one. Um, what factors pressure Asian Americans to succeed academically and professionally? What factors um, pressure Asian Americans to succeed academically, academically and professionally? And if you could um, yeah, put your answer in the chat, um, whether it's your personal experience or just things that you're aware of from others, it doesn't have to be you know, hyper-personal, but just what are some of the factors that you think contribute to the pressures that we face? Let's see. All right, parents, families, reputation, Scarcity mindset from family struggles. Pride. Honor and shame. Parents and a sense of responsibility. Social expectations. The experiences of other people, how other people succeed, um, and so we should too. Shame has come up again. Minority status. Um, maybe especially because we're a minority, we have to um, prove ourselves even more. Perfectionism. Yeah, another one on 
needing to prove our worth, another one on parental pressure, um, and the sense of obligation, maybe filial piety to take care of our parents. Yeah, these are all terrific. These are all things that I can relate to personally um, and that I think many of us on this call can as well. Um, I think what I'm hearing here is that there's maybe some uh, cultural features of Asian American that uh, experience that shape the way that we think about success. Um, and a lot of it also has to do with um, immigration background. So this is where, you know, the transgenerational, intergenerational component is really important, where um, for many of us, our parents, you know, immigrated here voluntarily for um, educational and professional opportunities. And by those opportunities, um, I don't just mean their own opportunities, but actually for the next generation's opportunities. Our parents may have been downwardly mobile. Um, they may have had more, you know, professional opportunities in their country of origin, but they chose to give those things up or they left because of poverty or other considerations so that um, their children would have opportunities that they did not. And because they became downwardly mobile, they took jobs that were lower than what they could have had in their country of origin. The hope is that we would be upwardly mobile and we would sort of make good on their success. So if, um, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm speaking obviously as a second generation person, I was born and raised here in the States. I'm Korean American. My parents grew up in a very um, economically depressed context. My dad was six, seven, eight years old during the Korean War between 1953, um, experienced severe poverty, hunger, and hardship. And then to work really hard to get to school, then to come over to the States so that um, my sister and me could have opportunities that makes you feel like you need to make good on your parents' sacrifice. There's this desire to succeed so that you can make good on your parents' immigration sacrifice. And um, this is also coming in a context for many of us, I think, where there's a real value on education, that that's how your family is defined. That's how you stack up against other people. Um, I can't see the faces in this audience, but I'm guessing you know, you're not the only one or I'm not the only one who, you know, had the pressure of knowing other kids SAT scores or GPAs and wondering whether or not you're going to do as well um, as they did or what colleges they went to and where are you going to go to school and this kind of thing. Um, and there's a kind of like for many of us, Asian obligation, sense of obligation where you're um, where you feel like you need to honor your parents. You feel like Doing well is a way of being obedient to your parents, of um, showing them respect for the sacrifices that they made. So these are all things that, you know, I think are legitimate concerns that we have, legitimate reasons um, that we have to um, pursue certain forms of worldly success. The challenge comes up when you're really, uh, is when you're starting to think about Christian faith and what it says about issues of justice, what it says about Christians' obligations to the poor, what it says about wealth and poverty, and specifically in the U.S. context, what Christian faithfulness means with regard to questions of race and of class, which are very closely together. I'm seeing the last comment um, on the feed is parents gossip without a filter. Yes, <laughs> I was thinking about that independently when I was thinking about the GPA and SAT comparison. But yeah, I think we're thinking about a lot of common experiences. So what I'd like to do is to sort of walk through um, uh, sort of three main topics as we think about these issues of uh, race and Asian American discipleship. One, I want to talk generally about what Christianity says about our obligations to the poor. Um, the second, I want to talk about issues of race and residential segregation, which is something that I care a lot about. And then the last is um, how does Asian American discipleship fit into this conversation about race and residential um, location? And just to um, be clear, you know, as I'm approaching this, I'm approaching this also as a learner. I'm not presenting this workshop as if I have the final answer on all these things. So very much open to feedback through the chat and the Q&A and panel afterward. Um, I'm doing my best with sort of how I'm thinking about these things now, but still have a lot of questions, even about some of the things that I'm presenting. All right, so I want to begin just by talking about some biblical passages that um, that stress God's concern for the poor. And um, yeah, 
maybe, you know, as I get into this, I can share about my personal background. So I grew up in a Korean American church in Northern Virginia. It was, I think, the biggest Korean church in the area. And um, Korean Christians can be sort of intense. Um, you know, the first generation of immigrants is very into early morning prayer, getting up at six o'clock in the morning every day and coming to church. Um, our senior pastor was always praying for like three hours every morning from four o'clock a.m., going through the whole church directory of thousands of names. And a lot of the youth group language that I heard growing up in that context was really about discipleship and sacrifice and giving up your entire life for Jesus. At the same time, I felt like we are, you know, really celebrated if we did well in school, if we, you know, demonstrated good academic achievements, if we went to a college, if we got, you know, well-paying jobs and so forth. And that was a tension that I experienced sort of growing up. The summer before I went to college and I was going to a secular school, I went to Princeton across the street from where some of you are right now. Um, you know, at my youth group, several leaders told me that secular schools or college in general is where a lot of people lose their faith. And I didn't want that to happen to me. So I made it my goal to just sort of read through the Old Testament the summer before I went to college. And I figured I'd sort of read the New Testament or, you know, heard enough of it through sermons and stuff. But I didn't really know what was in the Old Testament. And I just wanted to know that my eyes had scanned over every verse so that if some non-Christian at college um, challenged me about something that was in the Bible, I could in principle know that I had seen that verse before and, and it wasn't going to be a total surprise. And one of the things that struck me about when I was um, reading the Old Testament and then, you know, also moving forward toward the New was just how many passages there are about the poor, the orphan, the widow, the fatherless. There are just so many passages about the poor, about God elevating, you know, the younger child over the elder child, about God, you know, um, bringing birth to the barren woman about always looking to those who are on the margins. And these were passages that didn't really connect with me um, until later when I moved into the community where I am right now, which is a low-income African-American um, neighborhood in the west side of Chicago. And it was after living in a, a community of intense material need that I came to see these passages in a different light, that these passages that sort of, I realized they were there, but I didn't know how to connect it to my life they suddenly came alive to me in a different kind of way. So I'm just going to walk through a handful of passages that I think are relevant for us to think about as we think about Christians' obligation to the poor, just to make sure that we're aware that this is, in fact, in the Bible. I'm not just sort of making this stuff up. Just four passages. Um, Psalm 146. You see God's care for the poor. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth the sea, and everything in them, he remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry, sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. So, you, I mean, it's just a clear declaration of the character of God and what God does for those in um, situations of intense need or of disenfranchisement. The oppressed, the hungry, the prisoners, the blind, those who are bowed down. And then there's an interesting conflation of poverty with righteousness, right? And then the way that God frustrates the way of the wicked, that there's a kind of association between, you know, the righteous poor, and then the wicked oppressor, which we'll talk about in just another minute. Um, the foreigner as well, those who are not from Israel, the fatherless, and the widow. So God's character is to care about the poor, and we want to imitate God. Next slide. Jesus. That's a good place to go. This is from Luke 4. And um, this is really the place where Jesus declares his mission. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners 
recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, today, this day that I've just spoken and read this passage to you, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah, and this is a very important passage because it is the place where he most clearly declares his mission. Right? He's received you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he's about to start all the miracles through his public ministry um, in the Gospel of Luke. And he begins by saying that his mission is for the poor, for the prisoners, for the blind, for the oppressed. These are the people that we saw already named in Psalm 146. This is the category of people who are the most disenfranchised and marginalized in Jewish life. And I want to stress here that when Jesus says good news to the poor, there's a real tendency within wealthier context to sort of allegorize or spiritualize that, to say, oh, it must be good news to the poor in spirit, to, to say this is about people who um, you know, are humble in their own hearts. No, he doesn't actually say in spirit. He just says the poor. He says freedom for prisoners straight up, not just prisoners of lust or prisoners of pride or prisoners of gossip or something like that. It just is a declaration of poverty, incarceration, being oppressed, and so forth. And I think that's important to catch, especially from Luke, because Luke, of all the Gospels, is the Gospel that most stresses Jesus' concerns for the socioeconomically impoverished. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In Luke 6, we have a very similar sermon where Jesus just says, blessed are the poor. It doesn't say poor in spirit. It just says poor. And in Luke 6, it also says, cursed are the rich. And it doesn't just mean cursed are the rich who are proud. It means cursed are the rich, period. Luke is the one where, is the gospel where you see the story of, you know, the sinful woman washing Jesus' feet. Um, it's a, it, it's um, the place where you see Zacchaeus, um, the story of Zacchaeus, this chief tax collector who gives, you know, he, who gives back fourfold what he exploited from other people and gives half his wealth to the poor. Luke is where you see the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is covered with sores. He's poor. He's hungry. Lazarus is um, lying at the gate of this rich man who just steps over him and has a feast and a party every night. There's a sort of juxtaposition of material disparity and proximity. There's a rich person having a feast while there's a poor person right outside the gates. Lazarus is the only person in all of Jesus's parables who has a name. I think that's really noteworthy. He's a distinctly poor person. He's the only person in all of the gospels and all of the parables of Jesus who has a name. So Luke 4, we see that Jesus made the poor central to his ministry, and you'll see that all throughout the rest of Luke, and you will see that through Acts as well, which is sort of like part two of, of Luke. Third passage, scripture attributes poverty to oppression. I understand this is sort of a controversial thing, but I think it's important to see that sometimes we think that poverty is a sort of like an accident where you happen to have, you know, um, a medical crisis and that wiped out all of your savings. And that, of course, could be the case. You know, you happen to get laid off in some kind of... Um, change of industry. That, of course, could happen. Sometimes we attribute it to a failure of personal responsibility. That could sometimes be the case as well. But there's many cases in scripture also where poverty is blamed on oppression, the oppression of the rich, as opposed to the failures of the poor or some kind of bad luck. Jeremiah 22, woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. So he makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar, and decorates it in red. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, so all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me? to defend the cause of the poor and the needy. But your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood, on oppression and extortion. Note this connection 
between luxury and exploitative labor, right? This idea of, I want to build a palace. I want to have a great palace with spacious upper rooms, and I want to panel it with cedar. I want to have big windows, and I want to decorate it in red. You know, there's some passages in the Bible where um, you can't really understand what's going on without knowing the ancient Near Eastern context and the historical background of what exactly has been saying uh, is going on in that passage. I don't think this is really one of them. I think we can all think of situations where you've seen, you know, beautiful homes paneled with, you know, beautiful wood with giant windows, and they're just super luxurious. And scripture condemns this kind of luxury and excess. And it says it's frequently built on the backs of the poor, that it's frequently built through unrighteousness. These upper rooms are built on injustice. It's through making people work for nothing and not paying them properly. So there's a number of passages like this that attribute poverty to oppression. And this is really one of the main reasons why Israel is even sent into exile in the Old Testament. It's their idolatry, their worship of foreign gods, and it's also how they treat the poor. Those are two of the most common things that you see through the prophets for why God decided to bring destruction upon Israel through the exile in Assyria and then also in Babylon for the northern and then the southern tribes. Last, the prophets denounce those who practice piety while disregarding the poor. Why have we fasted, Isaiah 58, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit your workers. There's that language again. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves and sort of like public displays of piety? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Um, is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? I think this one hits home because there's a way in which you can display external piety. You can go to church, you can pray, you can read your Bible, you can fast, you can do all these things. And yet, if you are not treating right people right in your, in, in, with regard to economic justice, with regard to issues of poverty, if you're exploiting your workers, um, if, if you're not translating your personal worship and piety into some kind of social good, Jesus, the Bible, the prophets, they call this hypocrisy. They say, this isn't real piety. This is not really what it means to know the Lord. Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Which is not to say that the Bible and worship and prayer and going to church and so forth don't matter. But it is to say that if you do those things and you don't clothe the naked or provide the poor wanderer with shelter or share your food with the hungry, then that's not real worship. That's religious hypocrisy. And that's something that we really need to wrestle with if our understanding of discipleship does not um, incorporate broader social concerns. All this is straight from scripture. And, and I think, yeah, there, there's countless more passages that we could look at um, if we had the time. All right, I want to switch gears um, and think about um, sort of pivot, you know, our attention from these sort of broad, you know, scriptural considerations with regard to Christian, Christianity and the poor and Jesus' concern to the, and the poor and contemporary issues of race. And you're not going to find a lot of passages that are directly applicable to our contemporary issues of race, precisely because our modern categories of race didn't exist before about four or 500 years ago. So yes, there were forms of ethnic division and hostility within um, uh, the biblical times, but our contemporary issues uh, of race are, are different for, you know, uh, because they, they operate in a context that wasn't you know, directly confronted by the biblical authors. There's broad biblical principles that we can apply to these situations, but we need to analyze um, contemporary issues sort of on their own terms before we think about 
how scripture um, speaks into this, some of these things. And my um, remarks on this are going to come out of my personal experience um, living in the west side of Chicago. So as I mentioned, my family and I live in um, the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago. It is in the west side of the city. It is a low-income African-American community with among the highest rates of uh, poverty, um, violent crime, and incarceration in the city. Um, we've been here for now about 13 years. It is um, something of a famous city, a uh, famous um, neighborhood, because it was featured in this celebrated article called The Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. He sort of tells the story of the Black experience in America through a neighborhood in Chicago, and that's actually the neighborhood um, where we live. So I live in Chicago. I teach out at Wheaton. My position is in theology and urban studies. Um, I was originally hired just to be a theologian. But the more I was doing in the city, the more the college sort of wanted me to help students engage the city. So now about two thirds of my job is about getting students ready to um, uh, participate in a program that we have called Wheaton in Chicago, to walk them through that experience and then to um, help them to uh, continue to engage in issues of race and justice and, and um, urban context when they come back. Wheaton is about 25 miles away from my neighborhood, and it takes me about an hour to go back and forth, and I go out a few times a week. Um, I have been doing that commute for about you know, 12, 13 years at this point, um, going between the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago and the Wheaton, um, the, the Wheaton community out in the suburbs. And that has really uh, done something to shape my perspective on the world. Um, the contrast between what I experience in the Lawndale neighborhood and then what I see in the Wheaton community is just so stark and so drastic, even though these communities are so geographically proximate to each other. I mean, it's only 25 miles and, you know, there's areas in the city where it could be even closer to Wheaton um, or areas in the suburb that could be even closer to the city where I could be driving you know, five or 10 miles and I would be in a completely different planet with regard to life outcomes and the kinds of things that people face every day. So the kinds of you know, issues that we face with regard to poverty and uh, material um, disenfranchisement are just not really felt in a lot of the suburban areas um, in Chicagoland, um, which is not to say that all those areas are just bad, but there's such differences of life experiences that I pass between on an almost daily basis um, on a relatively short commute. And that material disparity across geographical proximity is something that I've never quite been able um, to get over, especially because there's a certain spiritual vibrancy in both communities as well. Both the communities are deeply, deeply Christian. So the black church is a very prominent you know, um, presence within the, um, the black communities of Chicago. And then Wheaton is obviously super Christian in its own ways. So when I'm going from one place of Christianity to another place of Christianity, and they're so separated by class and race lines, that's something that I can't, that I've never really been able to get over. And, you know, I'm very thankful uh, my college allows me to sort of combine these two worlds and bring students into the city. But this is something that constantly causes me sort of cognitive dissonance and, and, and a kind of, you know, I think legitimate frustration. As I was, um, as my family and I were first sort of joining um, the Lawndale community, for the first time, I became really interested in the history of, you know, marginalized communities in Chicago, um, and in particular, the predominantly Black neighborhoods in Chicago. And I just started reading a lot of urban sociology and, um, and exploring, um, you know, the history of my neighborhood in particular. And, you know, thankfully, there are a lot of books that I could read on the topic um, that were even specifically on the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago. And this is the broad general history. My neighborhood is deeply shaped by something that's called the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration um, occurred from the early 1900s to about 1970. And it was a time when about 7 million African Americans moved up to the north, to urban cities in the north from the south. Um, they were coming up um, for industrial job opportunities. They are also coming up because they were escaping Jim Crow and lynchings and the severe racial terrorism that they're experiencing down in the South. 
Prior to the, um, prior to the Great Migration, about 90% of the Black population in the United States lived in the South. After the Great Migration, it was about 50-50 in the South versus the North. So this is one of the most significant you know, demographic changes and migration um, changes that this country has ever experienced. When Black Americans moved North to the urban cities, they were not received with you know, the racial sensitivity and openness that they didn't experience in the South. They experienced very much the same thing, in some ways even worse. Um, they were blocked from many neighborhoods in Chicago by a practice called restrictive covenants that prevented home sellers from selling to a Black family. Um, there are racially discriminatory po uh, practices um, and, uh, uh, and policies that also exploited um, African Americans who wanted to purchase home. What you're looking at is a redlining map of Chicago. Um, this is something that was done through um, real estate um, assessors um, under the auspices of the Federal Housing Association or Federal Housing Authority in 1939. Basically, what um, redlining means is that um, uh, those who are involved with real estate would draw red lines around neighborhoods that had black people in it, and they would assess the property at zero at a worth of zero, which basically meant that there was a severe incentive to move out of those communities if Black people started to move in. And my neighborhood was um, one of the epicenters of redlining, which created this way for um, African Americans who wanted to purchase a home but couldn't get a loan through the normal real estate market um, to be exploited through people who are willing to sell to them. This is called contract selling. And I won't go into the details, but essentially what it meant is that um, African-Americans who wanted to purchase homes could not do so through a normal mortgage. They had to buy their houses on contract, which meant they only got title at the very end of all their payments. Um, and they were very vulnerable because they could get pushed out of their house at any point if they were failing to you know, comply very strictly with Chicago building codes and things like that. They were paying, they were paying for all the maintenance and repairs and without title, so it's sort of like the worst of both renting and homeowning. And because it was a restricted market, they were exploited with the price of the home itself. Um, during the mid 20th century, when all of this was happening, 85% of the buildings that black people bought outside of these two neighborhoods where they were allowed to live in the, through, um, despite uh, the restrictive covenants everywhere, 85% of homes basically purchased in the mid 20th century in Chicago by black people um, were purchased through contract. They were purchased on contract through contract selling and buying. And the, the average price that they paid was 73% higher than market value if they had just been purchasing through the normal real estate market. So if you're thinking about a $100,000 home, Black Americans were paying $173,000 for that home, not $100,000. And they didn't even get title at the beginning. They didn't get mortgages. They were only on contract and had to finish out the 30-year payment before they couldn't even get title. Because of practices like that, when African-Americans started moving into my neighborhood in the mid-20th century, you saw this phenomenon of extraordinarily speedy white flight. So my neighborhood was um, the biggest Jewish neighborhood in Lawndale um, up through the mid-20th century. And, um, you know, like Golda Meir, the second, you know, head of the modern state of Israel lived here. Benny Goodman lived here. It was like a really famous neighborhood um, in terms of the Jewish population. And even still in our community, um, you see all of these Jewish synagogues that are now Black Baptist churches. And you can even see sort of like the history on the buildings where these Black Baptist churches have menorahs, you know, and the Star of David and things like this on them. Between 19... 50 and about 1965, my neighborhood went from 90% Jewish to 90% Black. Literally flipped within 15 years, 90% Jewish to 90% Black. Um, Martin Luther King moved into our neighborhood in 1968-6 um, as he was trying to move the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's efforts up north. Um, primarily what they had been doing was the South and say Birmingham and Selma and Alabama and so forth. But they wanted to move south because they saw that there were severe urban issues that Black people were facing in the urban cities of the north. They looked around at all the different cities um, that were major options in the north. They settled on Chicago, and they settled specifically on the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago. 
And Martin Luther King lived in our neighborhood for about six months in 1966, about a block and a half north of where my family lives right now. Um, we drive by where he used to live every day. His particular home was torn down, but there's a new um, Martin Luther King apartment complex that's right there that sort of commemorates his time there. In 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April um, in Memphis, and Chicago exploded into riots, and my neighborhood in particular exploded into riots. And um, for several days, there was massive looting and fires and smoke everywhere. The National Guard was called in. The mayor told them to shoot to kill without even asking questions. And um, uh, the story was actually what happened was the Jewish residents moved out, but they retained their businesses in certain areas. And it's those businesses that were targeted after white flight. And, um, and those areas have never recovered, even you know um, 50 years later. So when George Floyd happened and there was um, an uproar in my community, there just wasn't all that much stuff to destroy. And there's a kind of wariness about doing so because um, a lot of that stuff had gone up in flames 50 years ago and we still feel the neighborhood effects now. So there are you know, historic sociological reasons that you can trace for why my neighborhood is so racially and socially isolated. And I should say that if you look at this map of um, Chicago um, on the PowerPoint, um, those areas that were redlined are almost identical to the areas that have the highest rates of violent crime and poverty in Chicago today. Like you can draw, a dr not all of them are exactly the same. The west and south sides of Chicago are where you see a lot of the, the rougher stuff. And you can draw a pretty direct line from the neighborhoods that experience this kind of racially discriminatory real estate practice and the neighborhoods that experience the greatest social challenges today. And so these things are not an accident. They're a function of historic forms of, uh, of collective racism that we really need to wrestle with. And for me, this really raises questions about individual and collective responsibility and about Christian faithfulness. So let me um, just walk you through a little bit of data. And I'm not a sociologist, um, but I'm going to do my best with this material. If I'm, this is often like a really educated crowd. I feel at these conferences. So if people you know, have things to contribute, happy to hear about it from the Q&A. Um, in 1976, after you know you had this phenomenon of, of, of white flight all through the 50s and 60s, there was a major survey of um, Detroit residents in 1976 just to test you know neighborhood preferences and where black and white people were willing to live. And it's really interesting to compare the data from um, the black respondents and the white respondents and to see you know how did white flight end up happening. And this is, you know, old data, it's from 1976, but it's actually really relevant in the sense that this is shortly after white flight happened, and we're still seeing a lot of the effects of, of white flight from the mid 20th century um, in the urban context of the North. So if you look at the right column, um, this is what uh, Black respondents said to this survey. Um, if your, this neighborhood were, if a given neighborhood were 100% Black, how willing would you be to move into it? If we're 70% black, how willing? 50%, 15%. If we're all white, how willing would you be to move in? And you'll see on that right column that African Americans are almost 100% willing to live in neighborhoods that are 15, 15 to 70% African American. Okay. So as long as there's sort of like a critical mass of black people, most black respondents were willing to move in. 95 to 99% said yes. You'll see that there's um, a lower number for if it's 100% black, only 69% responded yes and would be willing to move into that neighborhood. And that's probably because if our neighborhood is 100% African-American, that's associated with you know, fewer socioeconomic resources, um, you know, under-resourced schools and things like that. So you know, the black respondents didn't want that. Then how likely are you willing to move into an all white neighborhood? Well, that's pretty low, 38%, because you don't wanna be the only black person living in a 100% um, white neighborhood. So for African-Americans, basically, as long as you have a critical mass of black people, they're willing to move in um, and they're willing to live with you know, an 85% white neighborhood, as long as there's enough black people that they're not the only ones. This is the respondents, uh, the white respondents to the same survey. And if you look on the right, the percentage unwilling to move into the neighborhood 
this is a percentage of white people who are unwilling to move into a neighborhood based on the percentage of black people that already live in the neighborhood, based on survey data. Even if there's 8% black people in the neighborhood and it's a 92% white neighborhood, I'm just sort of going with white black here. I know we can complicate that, but this is, um, you know, very shortly after 1965 immigration. So we'll just go with, you know, dominantly, dominantly white neighborhood. A full quarter of white people would not move into a neighborhood that has only 8% black people. If you get to 21% black people, half of the respondents to the survey who are white would not move into that neighborhood. And then you look at the number of people who would be willing to move out of the neighborhood. You know, if it's 8% black, 7% are out. 21% black, 24% of white people are out. 36% black, 41% out. 57% black, 64% of white people are, are moving right away out of, the, out of that neighborhood. And if you run the data on this and sort of run um, simulations, what you discover is that even in the absence of racially discriminatory practices and policies, these exploitative real estate you know, um, agents and so forth, even without that, these neighborhoods would have flipped like that simply because white people do not want to live around black people. This is the way that it works. Um, you know, one black family moves in and, you know, the three most racist people in the community move out. Those three people are backfilled with three other black families. And that sparks like another 10 families to move out. They're backfilled by 10 more black families. And then there's 50 white families that are going to move out. It's a sort of spirals in, in, in its effect. And when you start to see all the moving bands up and down the street, you're like, you start to think as a white person, everybody's out of here except me. I don't want to be the last one behind. The best example I can think of um, how to explain this for, you know, from a recent example is toilet paper during COVID. Did anybody have the experience of going to a grocery store or a Costco or a CVS or whatever, and you were looking for toilet paper and it was out? Or there was like, you know, you could see that it was like half out and that sort of prompted you to get even more toilet paper than you actually thought that you needed. Or if it was all out, you went to the next door and the next door. And the more you discovered that there was no toilet paper, the more you wanted to hoard. So there's a sort of like collective effect where it's almost irresistible to feel like, wait a second, everybody's getting toilet paper except me. I have to get as much as if I find like the next door with like way more toilet paper that I need. I'm still going to get all of it just because I'm nervous that, you know, somebody else is going to take more and I'm going to be the only one left behind. And there's a sort of like emergent reality that happens where when you see what's going on back and forth, yeah, herd mentality, it's sort of like a mob, right? You sort of feed off the crowd. That actually happened with regard to residential segregation. So it's not as simple as like one person is racist, therefore they moved out. It's actually a sort of like collective effect. Like I wasn't born a toilet paper hoarder, but it for sure had this effect on me where, you know, I went to Costco, there's no toilet paper. I was going to like, everybody like that one. But there's a category of people who are toilet paper hoarders, but I'm not. Um, there, you know, there's this collective effect where the social environment affects the kind of individual decisions that you make. And if you're not really thinking hard about the collective effect of your decisions about how you're being shaped by that sort of collective effect, how you're shaping other people, then, um, then you're, you're participating in this larger social reality that has severely unjust effects for larger populations. From the 1940s to the 1950s, there was no neighborhood in Chicago that ever hit 20 to 25% black population that did not basically go up to 100 Sociologists discovered that there was a kind of like tipping point. There was a threshold. So once you hit that 20% number, it was going to skyrocket all the way to 100. And I think, again, if you just think of the toilet paper analogy, you can sort of see how that would happen that, you know, white folks can be okay if it's only like 8%, 10%, 15%. Then it hits 20. It's like, forget it. I'm out. I can start, sort of see where this neighborhood is going. And then you have the severe racial residential segregation that is also deeply tied to issues of class. Um, for me, this is what I really care about when it comes to issues of race. It is this issue of, um, uh, it, it's not for me primarily about, um, you know, 
like DEI trainings or microaggressions or whatever. It's about just how we live in such separate communities and how this has such severe life impacts on the most disenfranchised populations. All right, I'm told I have five minutes. So I am going to walk through, which is fine. Um, I'm just gonna walk through a few thoughts with regard to race and Asian American discipleship. And um, this, this is sort of like a teaser for like the ongoing conversations that, that we'll have in the, the subsequent workshops. Where do we fit into all of this? I think that one of the things that we have to wrestle with is the complexities of Asian American status in the, in, in the States and whether or not we are privileged. Um, and I want to say that, you know, it's really complicated. Um, you know, we operate within a racial binary that is so black white that it's hard for Asian Americans to know whether or not we fit on sort of like the more or less privileged side of things. I think on the one side of things, you know, we can think just very recently back to stop API hate, um, to, to all the anti-Asian racism that happened during COVID, the formation of Stop API Hate. One of the co-founders was Russell Jung, who's spoken for a number of um, the, uh, the center's events. We can think of the Atlanta spa shootings um, when eight people were murdered, six of whom were Asian American women. We have experienced you know, anti-Asian racism over the last few years, and we experience a sense of marginality and, and the sense that we are foreigners in this country. At the same time, we experience a lot of economic and professional advantages. This is data for, based on the US Census of 2020 um, from the New York Times. The US median household income is $63,900, and the college graduation rate is 34%. What you discover is that Asian Americans across many groups are significantly higher than these rates. And there is significant diversity about across different Asian ethnic groups, um, which is why I've included a variety of the data here. But we are actually, if you want to group Asians as a demographic together, which is a complicated thing to even do, um, we're the fastest growing um, immigrant group we're maybe the highest education immigrant group in the history of the United States. And of all the racial groups, we have the highest um, median income, even higher than white people. So the median household income um, in the US is $63,000. For Indian Americans, it's 123. Taiwanese, 97. Filipino, 95. I think that number is, um, is complicated for different reasons. Chinese, 85. Japanese, 84. Korean, 74. And if you look at the house, uh, the graduation rates also pretty high. Indian almost eighty percent, Taiwanese over eighty percent, um, Chinese sixty percent, um, Japanese fifty three, Korean sixty. There's tremendous diversity across this data as well. And so if you look at the Burmese, they are below the um, the median household income, um, an old eighteen percent college rate. The Hmong, the Cambodians as well. These are refugee Southeast Asian populations that have very different immigration histories than the US. But because for a lot of the more privileged Asian American groups, we are coming here voluntarily for educational and professional opportunities. And we're often coming through immigration filters that siphon people out if you have like tech skills or you have medical training or whatever, we end up doing really well in certain categories. Certain ethnic groups um, end up doing really well and I suspect a number of folks belong to those groups. All numbers have experienced that kind of privilege, and we really have to wrestle with it. I was talking about residential segregation. There's a more recent study, this is from 2001, that actually tested out um, how do white people feel about living with different racial groups if you factor out things like property values, crime rates, and the quality of public schools. So they you know, surveyed something like 1,600 white Americans and said, Here's a neighborhood with great property values. There's no crime and there's, um, uh, the schools are terrific. However, there's X percentage of Asians or Latinos or black people in the community. What they discovered is that the percentage of Asians in the neighborhood has no effect on white people's likelihood of buying a home in that hypothetical neighborhood. And they actually found the same thing for Latinos. They discovered a very severe effect, however, for black people that even if you name this hypothetical neighborhood as having great property values, no crime and terrific public schools, there's a very serious disinclination by white potential residents to purchase a home in that neighborhood. And that number will go even higher if you have children under 18. 
I think this raises a lot of questions for Asian Americans because residential location is very tied to schools. And as we think about Asian immigrant narratives, a lot of what we focus on is educational achievement. And educational achievement is tied to going to a good school. And going to a good school is tied to where you live. And where you live is actually very racially inflected. And so when Asian immigrant families think about the quality of their kids' education, if we are not thinking also about issues of justice, we're potentially participating in racially unjust structures and systems that leave out other groups and disenfranchise them according to historical anti-Black patterns. And I think that's something that those of us Asian Americans who have quite a lot of educational professional privilege, we really, really uh, need to wrestle with. I'll just wrap up with one slide, which is on the Good Samaritan. And all I want to say is that this passage about who is my neighbor has everything to do with proximity. That proximity um, is closely related to issues of moral responsibility. Well, this is a famous story, so we can just sort of jump through it really quickly. Um, you've got this man half dead on the side of the road. A priest walks by, a Levi walks by, they do nothing. And if you look at the text in verse 31, what it says is that the priest, when he saw what was going on, passed by on the other side. The Levite, when he saw this man, he passed by on the other side. They knew that if you get close to somebody, you have a responsibility to do something for them or to engage in them as a human. So they didn't want to get close. The Samaritan is the only one who helps this individual. And the first thing that distinguishes him from anybody else is that he actually came to where the man was. This is Jesus' story about what it means to love neighbor. And the question that I'd like to pose is, how can you love your neighbor if you're always trying to get into a wealthy neighborhood? If we're constantly trying to get into the best neighborhood with the best schools, it may be that we're failing in our responsibility to love our neighbors who are not able to have those kinds of opportunities because of historical and social um, uh, racism that we're inheriting and we have a responsibility to address.